as I turned onto Ghost Village Road to fish the Madison River below uh, Hebgen Dam, I came across this ranger warning of bears possibly feeding on a moose carcass in the area. Last month, an experienced guide was killed by a grizzly bear feeding on a moose carcass on a stretch of the Madison River several miles east of here near Baker's Hole. The date on the posting is a month old, so I'm going to head down the road and I'll make my decision when I get down there. The Madison River below Hebgen Dam is known for its natural beauty, wild trout, and dramatic scenery as it navigates one and a half to two miles through the mountains of the Madison Range before emptying into an eerie looking lake with protruding dead trees, haunting reminders of a disastrous earthquake that struck one August night in 1959, causing 80 million tons of mountain to collapse burying 28 campers in its path, forming Quake Lake, and forever naming this section of the Madison River, Ghost Village. Well, I'm here in Montana. Um, I decided I'd give uh, Yellowstone a little break because the temperatures were starting to get really hot. So I thought I'd fish some lower sections of the Madison and this is uh, just below that Hedgen Reservoir. And then the, the stream goes down to Quake Lake this way, right? And I was told by, the, by one of the guides uh, at uh, the Slide Inn that uh, the fish of fly fishing place here in Montana, that uh, it's just absolutely, the Madison, the river right here is just, it's, it's one of the prettiest sections. It's a, it's a nice fishing section, and, but there, there's one little heat of warning. Apparently, um, there was a moose carcass over this way. And as you can see from the, from the sign here, carcass in river approximately 200 yards southwest of this location do not approach. Bears may be active in the area. Now, uh, this is the Ghost Village Road and so we're gonna we'll give it a try but a couple of guys just walked down here and one fellow came walking up and he said that the the carcass isn't there anymore he said there are a couple of elk carcasses in the water but they're pretty much rotted away so hopefully um i just keep, have to keep my eyes open and uh, i carry i got bear spray and let's hope that's not an issue today huh but absolutely gorgeous area Thought it might make sense to move up here to the high ground. Check out the sea first if I see any bears in the area. Uh, which I don't see. And that's about the beginning of uh, Quake Lake. You can see, you can tell because you um, see all the dead trees in the water. And that uh, earthquake, you know, the whole mountain over there sort of slid into the lake, formed a formed a dam is what actually created the lake. Apologies for the shaky video. My mind wasn't thinking about filming while I was walking down here. Just looking around, make sure I don't see any moose carcasses or bears. They'll protect a carcass. I didn't say what kind of bear either. <laughs> and uh, this little tree lined area is kind of shaded, so I think maybe I'll avoid that area and head up this way. I do have the wind uh, in my favor, so if a bear were to come charging along, uh, he can smell me right now, and any bear spray I would have to use would go right in his direction. So I tied on a golden stone. I don't have a dropper on yet to see if I uh, get any action on this.
I noticed this ideal holding spot where the river cut into the bank forming a deep channel with a few overhanging dead trees. By throwing long casts, I hope to stay out of the trout's cone of vision and fool the trout into believing my stonefly had climbed out of the water and up the tree, only to fall back in the water as it spread its wings. Unlike mayflies that emerge in the water, stoneflies crawl out. Trout know this and will lie in wait under an undercut bank or overhanging limb along the edge of a river. Okay, so I see a marker on a tree down there, and um, it has that same kind of ribbon color, which uh, they were designating for the bear, the moose carcass. So, um, right straight that way. So I think this is probably as far down as I'm gonna go. <laughs> I think I'll stay uh, away from that area, regardless of whether or not that moose carcass is still here. Crazy places to go fishing, huh? Okay, so I have my uh, stonefly on. And then about, geez, I don't know, almost like two and a half feet at least, I have a little, uh, little sparkle, something or other, I can't remember the name of it, but it's, it's got a little tiny black bead head. So I'll first try this one little area here, then I'm going to move out and uh, try some of the, uh, the area by this little, uh, little island and the little channel that moves to the right of it, and uh, hopefully we'll get lucky. No fun casting these things. <laughs> yes. Looks like a Canadian goose and probably got some little babies and stuff over there, so I don't think I'll be dealing with them. Why didn't I bring my waiting staff? Okay, so I've managed to make it out to this little island. I was gonna fish along the side over there, but the Canadian geese look like they probably have a little nest. There's two of them guarding it. So plus that's also where that bear is supposed to have been with the moose carcass, so I don't feel I didn't feel like dealing with that. So you can probably see the big yellow stonefly. You can angle that camera down a little bit. And I got a dropper underneath it. And I try to toss it out a little further. Get some line out. Right from the start of my fishing, I noticed that there was no insect activity and no indication of fish feeding on the surface or movement of any kind under the water. You can see in the video how clear the water is. I'm wearing polarized glasses which gives me even greater visibility and I'm not seeing anything. So I'm now having to seek out where the fish might be and the rule of thumb is that a trout's first priority is cover for protection from predators and cover against the, the main current flow so the trout doesn't have to work hard to maintain its position. Trout prefer overhead cover 
um, cover that casts a shadow, like bridges, undercut banks with overhanging turf, or uprooted tree trunks and branches like the ones I'm facing. The trout's second priority is feeding areas, where they can, you know, where there's an abundant supply of food. And in rivers like this, that means holding areas next to faster moving water, feeding lanes carrying dislodged or emerging insects that the, the trout feeds on, and where the trout can quickly grab some food and then retreat back to its holding position. A holding area that offers both cover and access to food is where you'll find the largest trout. Get a nice drift. No takers. It's about as close to the structure as I want to go. Nothing. You have to cast big, wide loops when you've, uh, oops. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what happens when you cast big, wide loops. Okay, so, <laughs> casting big, wide loops. Where was I? <laughs> casting big loops, which I failed to explain, was to keep the smaller weighted fly on a two-foot dropper from tangling with the larger dry fly I'm using as a stimulator as well as an indicator. At the time, I also was aware that the air resistance of the larger fly was preventing me from getting my dropper to really tuck under the wood structure where I believed the, uh, the fish might be holding. And now that I'm reviewing this video, I'm wondering if my being in the line of sight of the trout might have been scaring them to not venture out to grab my dropper. There's an old saying when fishing water as gin clear as the Madison was this morning. If you can see the trout, the trout can see you. Not only am I in the trout's line of sight, I'm fishing with the sun reflecting off of me. I should have been fishing, the struc fishing this structure from the other side of the river. But then I would have had my back to the woods and with all the bear talk, I didn't want to do that. Now I'm casting much higher big loops. I want to just try an indicator. This big puffy stone fly, not the easiest thing to cat.
I'm going to try something different. <laughs> I'm not even getting any takes or anything. Maybe I should be just, just swinging caddis flies. Okay, so I tied on my uh, caddis and, uh, emerger, and I'm going to just uh, swing it around a little bit. Then I'm going to head over to the other side of this island to the main section of the river. Oh, casting so much easier. keep the cast a little low because the uh, wind is starting to really pick up. I'm swinging it right by those rocks where I wanted to. Shorten up on this one. Uh, right there. Oh man, they should have been all over that. Try it one more time. Hmm. Behind one rock and in front of the other. Now around the back side of this one. And in front of that other rock. No such luck. All right. Try the other side. Oh my God. No wonder this is bear country. I just came across an elk carcass. That's disgusting. I'm sorry I have to show you that. Ugh. Right, I'm gonna move on from this place. So here I am explaining how it's time to change tactics. Tying on a weighted stone fly and letting the current bounce it off the cobble to imitate a dislodged insect. When what I should be talking about is how gorgeous the scenery is and how lucky I am to be just fishing in such a beautiful area. Well, it was now time to move downriver and Fish the Madison at $3 Bridge and uh, West Fork uh, public access sites. Leaving Quake Lake, the Madison enters a narrow channel known as the Slide, emerging now into the Madison River Valley, pasture land rich in the nutrients that plants and insects thrive on and where wild rainbows and brown trout grow large. As I headed west on Route 287, I passed public fishing access sites, Reynolds Pass at the uh, Route 87 bridge, where camping is allowed, limited to seven days in a 30-day period, and the very popular $3 bridge, named, I assume, after the voluntary day-use contribution of $3 to fish there. Hoping to find a less crowded spot, I continued for another five and a half miles to the confluence of the Madison and the West Fork of the Madison River, exiting onto Sundance Bench Road, which crosses the river on Hutchins Bridge, and then bearing to my left uh, to continue on Sundance Bench Road for another 1.6 miles past the Madison Campground to the Eagle Day, or to the Eagle Nest Day Use uh, Public Fishing Access Site. The Eagle Nest access site was less crowded, only one other car when I arrived, and as it turned out, a fellow admirer of bamboo rods and a, and a member of the classic uh, fly rod forum. This fishing site has a, a 
gorgeous view of the mountains, which I'm showing in this picture here, of the, the Madison Range. And like the Ghost Village site, the bonus in having a well-maintained, clean toilet facility. Since my fellow forum member arrived before me, um, he got the chance to, you know, head downstream uh, to choose, and so I headed upstream. Well, it's a early Friday morning. Let's see, it's the 19th of June, and I'm fishing uh, on the, the Madison. I'm down by the West Fork, and I took the little side road up a, a ways, and we're gonna try, you know, I, I came out west uh, to do some dry fly fishing, but because this season is so strange, this, uh, the Madison River is now fishing. A lot of the rivers that you would think would have had a really heavy snowfall or snow melt, you know, they just haven't. So, but at the same time, um, I'm not fishing the dry flies like I wanted to. And Yellowstone, uh, the water just got so warm in there that it kind of like felt like it's time to maybe go check out, you know, some of these other uh, rivers in the area. You know, I'm probably going to have to start fishing with nymphs and I'll probably have to tie on my first indicator. But for now, I'm going to try this little thing. It looks like a chubby Chernobyl. And let's just see if there's a little action here. And, you know, uh, if, if, I, if, I get, if I get some luck, I'll turn the camera back on and, you know, hopefully we're catching fish. Okay, so I, um, <laughs> I gave up on the dry fly fishing and I've tied on an indicator. See this little yellow indicator? And now I've got a little tiny uh, stone fly. I don't know if you can see that. I tied these up um, sunlight. I tied these up uh, this past winter, so and it's going to imitate the uh, golden stone or uh, yellow sally or something along those lines. But it's 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 you know beaded. It's got a little bit of weight to it, and I pinched the barb. And I can't recall exactly what the size hook is, but it looks like it might be a ten, maybe with a little extension on it. So we'll give that a try, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay, uh, you might be able to see there's a number of people fishing on the other side of the river. And they got sort of like the inside bend. I sort of got a little bit of the outside bend, but it's, it's really not that noticeable. There's, a, there's some kind of like a little bit of a small caddis uh, midge, almost a midge fly hatch going off. So uh, I might switch over to something smaller, but the technique here, from what, uh, you know, from what I understand, you really only have to fish like four to eight, you know, probably no more than 10 feet off the shore. I'm looking for a little bit of structure, like as you can see the little riffles in the water out here. There's a, there's a big stone, and then there's, there's gonna be a few more you see going down. So I'm gonna sort of like fish, sort of start here, and then I'll sort of like fish down. I'm gonna fish the nymphs. As you can see, I got this big yellow indicator on here. So hopefully I got the camera angled so you can see this, but I'm just gonna, you know, just kinda just let it drift down. Oops, did I snag something? Oops, a little bit of snag. You know, I'm not fishing it far. Just try to get all the little sections here. It's almost make, like making a vertical or a horizontal grid pattern, if you will, right? I'm executing a side cast and not casting the nymph further upstream to avoid the glare coming off the water early this morning, while also moving a few steps downstream with, with each cast. Okay, so uh, here's the new strategy. So I've got a bunch of these little black caddis flies I've seen in the, uh, in the bushes and some crawling on my arms. And so I'm, I'm gonna, I've tied on this thing. It's, uh, it's, um, I've decided to go with a two uh, nymph uh, rig with with the indicator so i've got the little golden stone and then because of these small little black caddis flies i've got uh, what's called a i think it's called a three dollar uh, dip which is i think kind of famous for the fact that there's a bridge just down here called three dollar i just wave the guys are going by in the uh in the rafts morning no but um you are getting videoed right now so don't say no swear words or nothing <laughs> You may have noticed the folks floating by are not fishing. The Madison River from Quake Lake, 12 and a half miles down to Lyons Bridge, is designated as an 
the upper uh, walk and wade section. <laughs> Where was I? Oh yeah, so Chris over at Slide In, he ties these and he puts a little bit of sparkle. I don't know if you can see that, but a little bit of sparkle in there too to help, you know, maybe attract them. So let's see how this works. And uh, I've already, uh, you know, I pinched the barbs when I was tying these things, so I don't have to worry about that. And if I catch something, well, wish me luck. Okay, I haven't caught anything, but I am actually really enjoying fishing with the, with the little indicator and, you know, the two rig pattern. Uh, I have seen some larger caddis flies, but just one or two. And uh, so I'm just walking down this bank, throwing that fly out there. I'm sort of looking at where the structure might be. You know, there's not a lot, it seems, on this river. But, uh, there, you know, there's some big boulders and stones, and fish will typically will hide under those. Uh, I noticed that even one of the guide boats over there stopped and are fishing off one of these little sandbar islands. It's a beautiful day. And so after I give each of this little area a try, put some high stick in here too. Try to get a, thought I had something. Try to get a natural drift. Looks like I might have hung up a bit here. Oh, got it out. Good. <laughs> got a bit of a twig, I think, on here. Let me clear that. It's always good when you pull up these little twigs, take a look to see who's crawling on what, right? And as you can see, although he wasn't crawling on this underwater, there's your little, there's your little black like caddis fly, it just flew off. What else we got under here? Slime, more slime. Is this some slime that's moving? Ooh. I don't know. I don't see anything moving on it. Yeah, it looks like the fellow over there caught something. And he was just nymphing the other side. Fighting it a little. Oh, that's a good sign. I headed back to the car to load in a fresh battery and memory card before heading downstream. While attaching my camera to its chest harness, a car pulled up with a grandfather and grandson asking advice on where to fish. After sharing my thoughts and suggestions, I headed back out, not realizing I hadn't completed bolting my camera to its harness. The river downstream had a shallower gradient, so I was able to wade out into about two feet of water and began to nymph, casting upstream without an indicator, allowing my flies to tumble along the cobblestone river bottom, raising my rod, high sticking, watching my line for any hesitation, feeling for even the slightest strike. It came suddenly, a massive strike. I set the hook and reached to turn on my camera. With my reel now screaming as the trout made its first run, I heard a faint plop. I raised my rod high above my head as the trout continued to rush downstream. Seeing a faint sparkle by my feet, I reached into the water, grabbed my camera, and threw it up onto the shore behind me. As I reeled in the trout, it turned and flashed its side in front of me, a big rainbow, and it made its second run downstream. After another minute or so of not breathing, I landed the fish in my net. As I reached for my cell phone, the trout spit out my golden stonefly nymph, allowing me to take these pictures, these photos, and releasing the trout without the need for handling her, leaving me guessing her size, maybe 18 inches? 
My GoPro camera case isn't fully waterproof. Still, I had tried to turn on the camera, and uh, seeing these letters scrambled on its display, I quickly powered it down and pulled the battery, hoping I hadn't damaged it further. I went back to fishing, right in the same spot, and within a couple of casts, I was into a second large rainbow, lines screaming off my reel. Only now, when it flashed in front of me and started its second run, it spit out my fly. This time, the $3 dip. I made another couple of casts into the same area and hooked up with a third large rainbow, also screaming line off my reel, except this time, as it turned and flashed in front of me, getting ready to start its second run, it broke off my line. It, too, had also taken the $3 dip. I couldn't believe it fishing all morning only to lose my camera right when what I really wanted to capture on film. Big fish, screaming reels, the highlight of my fishing, the Madison. Talk about learning lessons the hard way. Please subscribe to my channel by clicking on the remote fly fishing icon in the lower right of this video and join me as I journey south into Idaho to fish the fabled waters of Harriman Ranch on the Henry's Fork of the Snake River, fishing the green and brown drake hatch on waters revered by many as Mecca for dry fly fishing worldwide.